This training covers basic construction of the centrifugal pump. It will cover parts breakdowns of our end suction and wet prime pumps, as well as covering the seals, bearings, impellers, wear rings and wear plates, and balance lines. Before the pumps are broken down into their different components, it is important to first describe the two variations of pumps that Pioneer has to offer. The first and most common variation is the horizontal frame standard centrifugal pump. It can come with different shaft attachment configurations like SAE, and the volute can be oriented in three standard positions, top horizontal, top vertical, or bottom horizontal. The second variation is the wet prime or self-priming pump. These pumps are driven in the same way as horizontal frame pumps, but are limited in suction and discharge orientations. Suction is always on the front, and discharge is always exiting the top, as shown. We will start with the horizontal frame Pioneer Prime centrifugal and work from the suction side to the driver's side. The first component is the priming spool. Bolted on top of that is the priming chamber. The priming spool is bolted to the suction cover and the suction cover is then bolted to the volute. Some volutes are designed to have an integral suction cover, but this example has them as separate parts, which is more common. The wear ring is next. It is press fit into the suction cover and designed to fit over the nose of the impeller as close as possible to improve hydraulic efficiency. Next, we have the volute and cleanout cover, and bolted to the discharge flange is the check valve, which is used to isolate the suction piping during priming, as well as prevent backflow. Behind the volute is the back plate and bracket. Some designs have these two parts combined in what we call a brack plate, but this example has them as separate pieces, which is most common. The bracket itself also comes in either an open or enclosed configuration, this will be discussed further in another slide. The pump bearing housing comes after the bracket and the internals of the bearing housing are also covered in another slide. The vacuum pump is either bolted to the top of the bearing housing or it can be mounted on the side using a separate bracket and is powered by the shaft. The last major piece is the SAE bracket which is used for mounting to an engine. If the pump were to be coupled to an electric motor, this piece would be replaced with a bearing cap and referred to as bear shaft. Gaskets or O-rings are always required when bolting any two metal components together that are exposed to fluids to prevent leaking. As mentioned earlier, the bracket is either an open or enclosed design depending on the pump model. It is important to understand the differences between the two and the different components that come with each. Let's start with the open style. The open bracket is just that, more open. It attaches the bearing frame to the back plate, but it also houses the seal gland where the mechanical seal is located. To lubricate the seal, Pioneer utilizes a run-dry reservoir that gravity feeds oil into the seal gland. The oil serves as a heat sink more than a lubricant. An enclosed bracket does not need the reservoir as the bracket serves as the oil bath for the mechanical seal. Oil is poured into the enclosed bracket and a transparent hose serves as the level gauge. The component breakdown covered the major components but skipped over the bearings and seals that are just as vital to the functionality of the pump. The mechanical seal is located behind the impeller inside the enclosed bracket, but before the bearing housing. Its purpose is to prevent fluid from leaking out of the back of the volute into the run-dry reservoir while allowing the shaft to freely spin. A cassette seal is installed in the bracket to keep the oil from escaping. Cassette seals will be covered more in another slide. Bearings are installed inside the bearing housing and vary in type and quantity depending on the model and size of pump. The bearing housing itself is filled with oil or fitted with grease zerks to keep the bearings lubricated. Another cassette seal is utilized on the driver end of the bearing housing to contain the oil. Let's now break down the self-primer pump. Again, we will start from the suction side and work our way to the driver's side. The first component is the inspection cover. It can be removed to inspect the impeller as well as adjusted using the screws shown to set the clearance between it and the wear plate. Companion flanges are shown on the suction and discharge of the pump. Another option is spool flanges, which are common in place of the companion flanges. Next is the volute casing, and located on top is the flapper access cover, which is held in place with the hand knobs. There is also a suction flapper valve, which is not shown. To the left of the casing is the impeller and bearing housing, along with the pump shaft. Just like the horizontal frame pumps, the driver's side will have either a bearing cap or SAE, depending on the driver. Seals are a critical component for centrifugal pumps. They allow the shaft to freely spin while keeping oils and other lubricants from leaking. The three types of radial seals used in Pioneer centrifugal pumps are lip seals, bearing isolators, 
and cassette seals. Lip seals are stationary and work by gripping the shaft with elastomeric bellows, which prevents lubricant from escaping, as well as keeping dirt and other contaminants out. The most common material is nitrile or Buna N, but they are also available in FKM, also known as Viton. The benefits of lip seals are low cost and low friction losses. The downside to lip seals is they require localized shaft hardening to prevent grooving and they have a limited lifespan. Bearing isolators are another popular type of seal for centrifugal pumps. They are described as non-contact, non-wearing, permanent protection seals. They function by having the rotor turn with the shaft while the stator is pressed into the bearing housing, so they do not require any shaft hardening. The internals consist of a unitizing element and a labyrinth to keep fluids contained. The positives are a long lifespan and very effective for containing level fluid. The negatives are the high cost and they can leak if overfilled with oil or if they are operating at an angle. The cassette seal is a fully enclosed seal capable of serving as an all-in-one seal, wear sleeve, and dust protector. It contains multiple sealing contact points with a fully incorporated unitized design. The sealing elements are internal, therefore minimizing shaft finish requirements and shaft grooving. Other advantages include lower cost and size than bearing isolators, and they also seal more effectively than bearing isolators. Pioneers in the process of replacing all lip seals with our own in-house cassette seals. While mechanical seals serve a similar purpose as the three radial seals we just described, they function in a very different and unique way. Mechanical seals use both rigid and flexible elements to create two sealing surfaces that slide on each other while allowing the shaft to pass through. The two surfaces are both hydraulically and mechanically loaded to maintain adequate contact. The sealing surfaces must be very hard and flat to be effective. Common sealing surface materials are silicon carbide, ceramics, and tungsten carbide. Before we move on, it's important to cover another sealing solution that is less common but competes with a mechanical seal. Gland packing consists of a braided rope-like material that is packed around the shaft. It physically stuffs the gap between the shaft and housing to minimize leaking. The rope is wrapped around the shaft and squeezed by the stuffing box to make it expand radially and compress the shaft. The benefits of packing are its cost, ease of installation, low turnaround time, and it can handle misalignment and aggressive fluids much better than mechanical seals. Some negatives are that it will leak over time, it has a short lifespan, and it requires more maintenance and adjustment due to the fact that the rope wears over time and requires constant tightening and eventual replacement. Bearings are what allow the shaft to rotate freely with minimal friction losses while keeping the shaft secure. The bearings used in centrifugal pumps come in two main types, ball bearings and roller bearings. Single row or double row ball bearings are good for carrying typical radial and axial loads. Roller bearings are used for high radial loads, loads perpendicular to the shaft center line. High axial loads, loads along the shaft axis, require angular contact bearings. These bearings are ball bearings, but they are designed with enhanced walls to counter the axial loads. To counter axial loads in both directions, double angular contact bearings are used. These are basically two angular contact bearings back to back. The impeller is the primary working component of a centrifugal pump. It is rotated by the pump shaft and designed to add energy to the liquid. The two main types of impellers used in Pioneer pumps are enclosed and semi-open. Let's first start with the enclosed impeller. Impellers are considered enclosed when the vanes are sandwiched between two surfaces known as the front and rear shroud. Pioneer frequently utilizes this design. Enclosed impellers are costlier to manufacture but generally have higher efficiencies. They are paired with one or two wear rings to prevent backflow on the suction side. Hub wear rings are used in conjunction with balance lines to counteract axial thrust. Semi-open impellers handle saw as well and are used in our self-priming pumps. These impellers are typically less efficient than the enclosed impellers and they are paired with a wear plate. The two most common ways an impeller is fixed to the shaft is keyed with an impeller screw and threaded. The next slide will show what those two designs look like. The majority of the Pioneer Pump lineup incorporates the key design. Parts include the key, tong washer, retaining washer, centering washer, and the impeller screw. All three washers are aligned and locked in place by the tong washer, which is fixed to the shaft bore. To adjust back vane clearance, shim washers are added or subtracted at the bore of the shaft. 
The advantages for the key design include ease of removal and the assurance that the impeller cannot work itself loose no matter what direction it is spinning. The threaded design has two variations, fine thread and acme thread. The lower image shown is the fine thread and consists of a thrust washer and an o-ring. The impeller is initially tightened when assembled and then it utilizes the reaction forces of the water to keep it torqued while pumping. Back vein adjustment is achieved by adding or subtracting shims where the thrust washer is located. This design has less parts and is simple to assemble but some disadvantages include possible loosening of the impeller if rotation is reversed and difficulty removing the impeller. The Acme design has much larger threads and utilizes a shaft sleeve also sealed with an o-ring. It was mentioned earlier that the enclosed impellers use wear rings and the semi-open impellers use wear plates. Wear rings are used to seal the pressure leakage of the liquid between the inlet of the impeller and the pump casing. The tighter the clearance, the higher the efficiency, but there is no adjustment. They are considered a wear part and will need to be replaced periodically. Standard materials are usually cast iron or stainless steel depending on the fluid. Wear plates serve the same function as wear rings, but for semi-open impellers. They, however, have the advantage of being adjustable. Standard materials consist of cast iron, 1018 steel, or CD4 stainless steel. Similar to the suction wear ring, high head pumps also have a hub wear ring located at the back of the impeller. Both have the same function of limiting recirculation and isolating specific areas of the pump to maintain pressure. Pumps designed for high heads have a large pressure differential between the discharge side and the suction side of the impeller. This differential creates axial thrust on the impeller and shaft and can damage the bearings and seals. To balance the pressure between the front and back of the impeller, a balance line is installed as shown in the images. This concludes centrifugal pump construction part one. We covered the parts breakdowns of both our end suction horizontal frame pumps and the self primer pump or trash pump. We also covered radial seals, cassette seals, bearings, impellers, wear rings and wear plates, and balance lines. Be sure to come back for part two of centrifugal pump construction where we will discuss flanges, drive-in configurations, our priming systems, and materials of construction.